Now, a reporter's return to Cairo after the Egyptian Revolution. Margaret Warner has the story. Charles Sennett, founding editor of the online news site Global Post, was among dozens of Western journalists in Egypt during the February uprising that toppled President Hosni Mubarak. Reporting for a frontline documentary, Sennett spent days in Tahrir Square talking with the protesters, from the young Facebook crowd to members of the Muslim Brotherhood. In July, Senate returned to Cairo as a second wave of Tahrir Square po protests was underway, mostly directed at the military council that's now running the country. He has written a piece with accompanying video for Global Post and Frontline's website, and he joins us now. And Charlie, welcome back. Thanks. So you went back five months after Mubarak was ousted. You went back to the square. What did you go looking for? What did you find? We went looking for the same people we had gotten to know in the square during the revolution. And they were from all walks of Egyptian life. Muslim Brotherhood, you had Coptic Christians, secular activists from the April 6th movement. But we basically wanted to check in with them and see where this revolution had come after six months. And what we found was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fractured uh, movements, a lot of splintered parties, and a sense that the unity of Tahrir Square had, had disappeared. Now, in fact, uh, we hear that sentiment expressed by a young man, one of your young activist connect connections, Mohammed Ab Abbas, who was from a work is from a working class Muslim Brotherhood connected family. And let's listen. We have trouble problems, a lot of problems. But now we haven't one hand yeah. that were here last time. What do you gain by taking Tahrir back? How does that push the revolution forward? It makes us remember why we're here. The revolution is almost stolen by. We don't know by whom, but it's uh, achievement not satisfied us till now. Why is he so disillusioned? Yeah. What you're seeing there is Muhammad Abbas, who was really one of the inspirational members of the youth movement of the Muslim Brotherhood. He's now been removed from the Muslim Brotherhood because he joined a party that didn't meet the approval of the Muslim Brotherhood. Many of his friends who he got to know who come from these different places in Egyptian society have, have sort of splintered off and gone in different directions. The unity of the revolution has now left them all headed in very different directions. And, and you're right, you could really feel that despondence. It's also coming right off of renewed protests. Suddenly, in early July, the protests erupted anew. Um, Al-Aram has called it the second wave of the revolution, where the demands were basically um, put forward once again to go back to the beginning to say this is really about police brutality and this regime. Right, and we have a clip that shows this. Now, this is Gigi Ibrahim, who was an Egyptian-American, sort of made famous in, in the Frontline documentary. Right. She ended up on the cover of Time magazine, and she sounds really angry. We've got a clip of that. Okay. Last night was really about the treatment of police that hasn't changed since the revolution, and this was one of the main main things that made the revolution happen to begin with. Uh, the tortures in prison. Let's remember Khalid Saeed. Uh, nobody uh, is, has been uh, really sentenced uh, in accountability of any torture case or any uh, kind of killings of the martyrs since the revolution. <laughs> Exactly the same reason that we started this revolution calling for accountability and to stop police brutality and to stop torture and to stop the treatment, the brutal treatment and ruthless treatment of the police uh, with citizens on the street. Now they are furious because they don't feel what the people, uh, police and, and security people who were responsible for the killing of protesters have been punished. That's correct. They're really saying, let's go back to the beginning where this revolution began on January 25th, known as Police Day, a day when you're supposed to honor the police in Egypt. But it was a joke to the Egyptian people that really this police force was seen as very brutal and corrupt. So they were saying, look, we've had 840 people, unarmed protesters, who were killed during these demonstrations. And 
virtually none of the police had been brought to justice. So do you think the army was hearing the Gigi Ibrahims and all those people when they did actually put, started Hosni Mubarak being tried and his chief of the interior? I think it's a great question. And, and I think, yes, I think they did hear the demonstrations rising up again. And I think that's why Al Aram called this the second wave of the revolution. That what you, what you had was a revolution going adrift. The military was quite pleased with that delayed the elections, let's just get back to life. And I think most of the Egyptian people desire that. They want to return to normalcy. They want to get back to business. Tourism is a $12 billion industry in Egypt. They want that back. But the protesters were saying, we can't go back to status quo. And that small reminder of putting thousands of people back in the street, I think the military heard that and has now made some movements. Now, is it enough? Will it last? What will happen with the elections? All of these questions uh, are very much in the air right now in Egypt. Now, after hearing these angry or disillusioned young people, you, there's also another clip I thought we could play from Ahmed Maher, another major figure. Wasn't he mm -hmm. a founder of the April 6 movement? He was. And he seems to have a sense of perspective, mm -hmm. maybe because he's older. Let's listen. <laughs> It's natural that after any revolution, there be a transitional phase. I think that in Egypt specifically, there has been a period of imbalance. This is perfectly normal, but with the presence of a youth force monitoring and pushing for democratization, it will surely succeed, no matter how long. What does he mean there, there will be balance? What, what is he talking you know, about? Ahmed Maher is an engineer by trade, mm. civil engineer. You're right. He's very calm. He's, he's wise. He's very stepped back unlike much of the Twitterati, as they're called, mm -hmm. you know, the people who are online the Gigi activists, the Gigi Ibrahims, yeah. who are sort of all over the map. He sees this as a structural movement, almost like engineering in the revolution. And he says, you know, you have to be patient with this. Can he convince them of, of that? I don't know. But I think what he means by, by it's natural is that revolutions produce chaos. Out of that chaos now has to emerge a new democracy. How that's going to happen very much an open question. Ahmed Maher is also reflective because April 6 movement is not a political party. They've fractured into political elements, but they're actually a social movement and much more about social engineering than they are about revolution. So as you left, Charlie, what was your conclusion about the protest movement itself? You said it's fractured. H has it lost its sense of purpose? Has it, it lost its, its esprit? I mean, you have one scene in your piece, which, mm -hmm. I, which I commend to our viewers, in which you talk about one of these protests you went to that didn't, definitely didn't have the energy of February and January and February. I think Egyptians are tired. I think they've been through a lot. This revolution was an extraordinary event, as you know. Uh, we both covered it together. I, I think what you see in Egypt now is fatigue but not a loss of hope, a sense of determination that there's a lot of work to do and a feeling that there's not a lot of organization or coordination to get that done. The political parties haven't formed. The elections are looming. In November? In November. And it looks like the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, its new political party, stands poised to take about 30 percent of the vote by, by, you know, that's a modest estimate. Um, the Salafists could take 10 percent. The, They're the, the very rigid... The very rigid sort of Islamists. puritanical Islamists. And then you have other parties like the NDP, the National Democratic Party, which was Mubarak's party, which is fractured but still represents business interests and new formulas. It's, it's a puzzle that hasn't come together, but I would not say that, that the leaders of this revolution have lost hope. I think what they're looking for now is coordination, and they're going to have to pull back to their corners and organize and really affect change. All right. No one's going to give that to them. They have to give it to themselves. All right. Charlie exactly. Sennett, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks, Margaret.